Hello all, um, welcome to our webinar today titled Privileged Perceptions, Comparing Practitioner Disparities and Understanding First-Generation Student Barriers. I am Dr. Terry Vaughn III, Vice President of Research and Director of the Pell Institute at the Council for Opportunity in Education, located in Washington, DC. Um, at the Pell Institute, we specialize in college access and success research aimed at improving the college experiences of first-generation college students students from low-income backgrounds, and students who have been historically marginalized within higher education. One of our key initiatives is our Pell Internship Experience, which is currently funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where we work with these students and developing researchers who are equally passionate about equity research within higher education. During the internship, students participate in a six to 12 months research project where they develop their own research question, design and implement their study, and then analyze the findings or results to produce an original report. I'm excited to introduce Josh Ferris, who recently completed his project and will be sharing some of his findings with us today. Josh is a consultant and a public speaker who is deeply, who deeply cares about issues facing first-generation college students. With that said, we will now begin with Josh's research. During the session, if you have any questions, please enter them into the Q&A box and we will answer them near the end of the session. Thank you. Josh, you want to get us started? Hi, everyone. So thanks for allowing me to be here. And I see some familiar faces out in the chat panel. But if you're new, uh, if you would like, you can share a little bit about where you're from or where you're coming from today in the chat. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and get started so we can end on time. So can everybody see my screen? OK, so. That the study of my report is titled Privileged Perceptions Comparing Practitioner Disparities in Understanding First Generation Student Barriers. Although, when I say that just to fit the title, I also mean first generation and low income students. So, a little bit of how we're going to go throughout today, I'll touch about how I came to do this or investigate this aspect other than the research between practitioners, what led me to my thesis. Then I'll talk a little bit about how I conducted the study and what categories of need I explored. We'll dive into some of the results, which will be the meat of this, I think, what a lot of you showed up to see. And then we'll end with some recommendations for both uh, practitioners um, as well as future research in this area. Uh, limitations about the study, uh, about how far we can go with it just from these findings. And then we'll have some discussion questions between me and Amanda before turning it over for audience questions. So a little bit about coming into this study. I realized very early on that when I started college that access does not uh, equal success. I think in popular media, this is often something that we see when someone gets that, that full scholarship into that university that it's just all over when in reality, it's just the beginning. And I noticed that I just kept getting told by different types of practitioners, those that worked with me at the high school level, which I call access practitioners, that if you just make sure you do well in your classes, you'll be fine, you'll be successful. Or even at the success level, if you just get an internship, you'll get a job. Or if you just go to office hours or network, you'll be successful. And I realized when I had challenges either in the college, in college, that this kind of surprised those that helped me before I got into college. And then in the same vein, when I, I had challenges that I experienced after college that I think surprised many people that worked with me at the college level. And that re realized me to this uh, thesis today that uh, there is a persistent dis disparity between access and success practitioners, uh -oh, uh, their perceptions on the challenges that students like me, first generation and or low income students face uh, before, during and after college. And that their, their perceptions of their, um, of these practitioners often influence their interactions with students. So a little bit about methodology. Uh, in terms of recruitment, I recruited both on TRIO and non-TRIO listservs. Particularly for non-TRIO, it was first year experience and transfer listservs, for those that serve those populations of students, uh, as well as social media. So for instance, one of the biggest Facebook groups is the Empowering First Gen Facebook group for practitioners. It's about 8,000 people, and then various LinkedIn uh, groups as well. The, it was an open-ended qualitative survey. So 
I basically asked this question five times in, in each of the different categories. What are the barriers that you believe students face accessing college financially, academically, socially, personal, professionally uh, after college? And so in terms of the definitions, when I say access, that's interchanged with those that work with students at the high school level. So this can be teachers, this can be school counselors, this could be principals, this could be uh, trio access staff, such as Upward Bound or Talent Search, or even other non-trio access staff. When I say success practitioners, that I mean that to be interchangeable with those that work with students at the college level. So think professors, think advisors, think deans, trio success programs like Student Support Services, McNair, or non-trio success programs. Uh, another category I kind of explored but didn't, won't really touch on depth is that in active, when I say active practitioner, those are people that are hired specifically to work with first-gen and rural income students. So again, that could be through TRIO or non-TRIO programs like College Advising Corps or Bottom Line versus passive are what I call general practitioners that uh, may, they're not hired to work specifically with this population, but they may, a lot of their students may end up being first generation and low income. So that could be your high school teacher, your school counselors, professors, the deans that might just end up working with those. Uh, and then after I collected all the responses, I conducted a thematic open coding. So looking at all the responses, breaking them down and seeing what they had in common, and then finding some kind of axiom or, or commonality between those before doing the uh, going into the findings. Uh, so th these are the categories that I explored that I mentioned earlier. So the two that I'll touch on, I think the rest are self-explanatory. Access is just challenges that happen before arriving on campus that influence their experience. The financial, academic, and personal social are the three categories explored uh, challenges or barriers while they're in college. And then professional are related to the challenges that they face while in college that hinder their ability to transition out successfully either into the workforce or into graduate school. So let's get to the meat of this. Here are the results broken up by section. So just in terms of the responses I collected, uh, after filtering for access and success practitioners, I had a whole total of 143 responses. Out of those, they were more likely to be TRIO affiliated practitioners. They were more likely to be active practitioners, so hired specifically to work with first-gen low-income students, as well as they were more likely to identify as first-generation and or low-income themselves. And then when I say a disparity when looking at the findings, I mean any difference between the percentage of respondents greater that equal to or greater than 10 percent and that was just an arbitrary number that i decided on in terms of the types of respondents it was a lot more heavily leaning towards sex practitioners so looking at the views of those that work with students at the college level uh, if they were researchers there were so few that i excluded them and then as well as others that did not were not researchers or practitioners were also excluded So here are some of the sub themes that I found in the access category that both access and success practitioners noted as challenges or barriers for students they interacted with. So uh, I'll just run through them and then the ones that uh, might need more explanation beyond what it says in there, uh, I'll give. So college applications, financial aid and affording college, family support and influence, institutional barriers and support, intersectional identities, college exposure. Uh, so in terms of the family support influence, uh, that can be go both ways where either the family does not encourage the student to attend college or that they might encourage them to pursue a certain type of field or to provide financially while they're in high school. Uh, and, and at the same time, a kid is per, pursuing post-secondary options. In terms of intersectional identities, that is just looking at uh, other barriers beyond the first gen status, so that could be race uh, or class, micro or map regressions that they experience related to that either coming from peer their peers or from professionals or practitioners, uh, so teachers, school counselors, access staff, et cetera, that in uh, that uh, serve as barriers to their experience. And then college exposure, again, there's just so many unspoken rules of uh, higher ed that we call the hidden curriculum understanding how to navigate that when getting into college or access. So with all those subcategories, the two that were noted as disparities were family support influence and college exposure. So uh, access practitioners were a bit more likely 
almost twice as many to re report issues related to family support and influence than those that work with students at the college level. Uh, this was reversed for to when talking about issues related to college exposure, that more success practitioners noted this as a barrier uh, for students at access in college compared to their access counterparts. Almost half of all success practitioners noted that as an issue. I know almost a third of access. So here at the end of each result, I'll give a quote just to kind of demonstrate this. So uh, this is from an access practitioner. If it says AA, the first letter denotes if it's access or success. So I believe that first-generation low-income students experience personal hardships and challenges such as homelessness, lack of stability, and sometimes lack of assistance from their parents, guardians, and their inability to provide financial documents for the FAFSA or TAP applications family conflicts and guilt of leaving their families and financial responsibility at home if they have one. So I think that accurate it captures uh, one of the challenges we noted before with having to do with, with family challenges. All right, so moving on to the financial category, I put this one first just because financial issues is the number one reason why low-income and first-generation students end up dropping out. And so uh, again, I'll read through and just uh, describe those that don't make as much sense for more clarification. So cost of attendance or what I call survival expenses, thriving expenses and opportunities, working, understanding financial aid options and requirements, budgeting, and family influence. So the first one I'll talk about is thriving expenses opportunities. So these are expenses that often go beyond the cost of attendance and not included in the calculation sheet to fund to be in order for students to be able to thrive while in college, so that participating in clubs or other extracurriculars, pursuing internships either during the school year or during the summer, break programming, particularly for fall, spring, and winter break, uh, studying abroad or other high impact practices. As one, as one participant noted, it was the cost of just keeping up with all the rest of the other students. Uh, working understanding, and then. In terms of understanding financial aid options requirements, if you have sources of funds coming from various sources, uh, it can be hard to understand all the requirements. So some scholarships might have a GPA requirement to keep up with that students might not know about, or they might be required to commit to a certain major and then they get a major and they don't like it and then they lose the scholarship or not know that there was a requirement or that some scholarships are only for one year only and they're not renewable. So out of those categories, the two that were noted as disparities between the communities were thriving expenses opportunities where access practitioners were more likely to note that as a challenge for students compared to their counterparts at the success level. Uh, and then it was reversed for working where those that work with students at the college level were almost a third of them, over a third of them were more likely to note challenges related to working while in school to support family or themselves as a challenge, more so than access practitioners. Uh, here's a quote, these students from a success practitioner. These students have to make difficult decisions when it comes to their finances. Sometimes they have to decide if they should pay a bill or buy their textbooks. These decisions trickle over to the hard decisions of dropping classes or reducing the hours they work. It may seem like an easy decision, but not for students who depend on their income to finance their academic careers. And I think this really encapsulates some of the financial challenges and decisions that many students make day in, day out on pursuing their education. Next is academics. So I put that in this order because for academics, that tends to be the second most common reason that first generation or low income students drop out of college is this kind of lack of adjustment to the, the rigor of college compared to their high school experience. And so some of the findings for that are academic preparation, seeking support, imposter syndrome and mental health, understanding the hidden curriculum, lack of institutional supports, and then competing demands. I think that in terms of the institutional supports, this could be either that the, a college does not have these supports set in place academically. So this could be tutoring centers or writing centers as examples. They might not have them, or there might be barriers that are prohibitive in their accessing of these resources. So they could be at from the typical nine to five and the students work from nine to five or that they could require, there could have be a fee that students can't afford to pay. Or I think it was very common is that many students just don't know about the resource. And if you don't know about it, then it's almost like you don't have a resource. 
<laughs> for the two challenges noted between the communities as disparities, we have imposter syndrome and mental health, as well as understanding improving curriculum. For imposter syndrome and mental health, that was much more likely to be noted as a challenge for those that work with students at the high school level than for those that work with them at the college level. And then finally was reversed for understanding the hidden curriculum. So success practitioners was much more, well, about 10% more likely to note that as a challenge compared to their access counterparts. Yeah, this is from a uh, success practitioner. So they said lack of institutional knowledge, AKA the hidden curriculum, really knowing basic college strategies, such as studying two hours for every hour in class. And even what should I be doing when I study? Does that mean reading? Does that mean homework? Do I just look at my notes? It really is a lot of throwing darts at the figurative academic wall unless guidance can be offered. We're really talking about the hidden curriculum and understanding how to either manage your time or study skills was uh, mentioned this. Uh, my biggest pet peeve of a category is this personal social. So personal, how does it relate to ourselves and our own individual development? And social, how does it relate to our development with our relationships with other people, whether it be family or it be peers or it be faculty and staff? Or coworkers, et cetera. Uh, so imposter syndrome, race differences and stigma, self-worth and belonging, finances and working, pre-college identity separation, mental health, family support and influence. So I'll say in terms of that in race differences and stigma, this is can definitely be a challenge for students that are also students of color and they are attending a predominantly white institution or that they were so used to going to a school where a lot of students looked like them. And then that just was not the case uh, when they went there facing challenges related to either just at best cultural differences and then at worst various micro macro aggressions that lead to a sense of alienation beyond uh, education and, and social class. In terms of pre-college identity separation, I think this one could be a whammy where if you're not only the first in your family to go to college, but also maybe one of the few in your communities, it can lead to this identity separation as you accrue continued experiences while you're in college, while your family and your community are experiencing a different experience. It can often lead to resentment between family members, between friends, as they accrue this kind of uh, cultural and social capital that we deem within higher ed. Um, that could be a barrier for students um, as they're adjusting to that transition, especially their first couple of years. And so in terms of category differences or disparities, uh, imposter syndrome. So this was very slight, but I included it anyways. Uh, access practitioners were just a bit more likely to note that as a challenge than their success counterparts. And then racial differences and stigma that those that work with students at the high school level were more likely to note that as a challenge compared to those at the success category. And I'll just make note that only 4% of success participants noted anything having to do with race specifically, which I thought was extremely low. Uh, and then a quote to encapsulate, this is from an access practitioner. I work with young people of color who come from communities where almost everyone looks like them or where they are not an anomaly. College is a traumatic experience in this way, where they are visually outsiders, but then often put in positions to educate the other young people around them about their experiences and history as people of color, whereas they are all just young people trying to figure themselves out. So again, getting back to this issues related to uh, race stigma all in college and that often uh, another barrier that students can take on in addition to being first gen and or low income. So this last category, it's not necessarily uh, important for students to graduate, but I think in this day and age, it's the most understudied category research-wise in that helping students prepare for life after college, uh, that can be uh, a challenge as well. So I found in terms of the sub-themes mentioned, social capital and networking, job search, resume, and interview preparation, understanding career pathways, cultural capital and access to thrive opportunities, structural systemic, transition, imposter syndrome and lack of skills for success. So I'll say that in terms of understanding career pathways is really a lot of students might pursue a major, but then not realize all the different types of careers that can be used with that or that you are not your major. And oftentimes a lot of students don't translate a major to a specific career. And so that might become a challenge later on if they try to get into a job. Uh, for instance, I had one student I advised one time who she wanted to be a doctor and thought that she could just 
be a doctor after undergrad or another who thought they could be a, a psychiatrist after just four years of undergrad and um, realizing too late that that wasn't the connection between psychologists and undergraduate versus uh, graduate level pursuits. Structural systemic, so again, having either not having access to those supports, or them not being available or not knowing about them. So they could be career centers or career center advisors or mentors such as alumni. Uh, or not being available at the times that they can access them or having a cost associated with them that make it prohibitive in accessing them. Transition is the last one I'll talk about, and that is really just the aspect of after you graduate, how do you go from point A to point B? So a lot of people don't talk about uh, having the money necessary to save up before graduation to afford to relocate or how to ask for relocation or having the money to wear professional attire to certain places or for a security deposit, if you go re uh, get rent uh, somewhere else, or how to pay back your student debt if you have loans, one of the challenges might not always be mentioned uh, until uh, after graduation. So the two that were mentioned as disparities in this category were cultural capital and access to thrive opportunities, where whereas success practitioners, half of them noted this is a challenge uh, for career and professional uh, category. And which is a good bit more than their access counterparts. And then the reverse was said when talking about issues with systemic or accessing certain resources or having them available, access practitioners were much more likely to note that as a challenge at the college level than those that work with these students at the college level. Um, I thought that was interesting. And I have a few theories to that, but we're not getting to that right now. So I, I, there are three quotes I want to mention here just because there was so much nuance to this category, and it is the most understudied category. I think it's only received uh, public focus within the past five, 10 years. So the first one is from a success practitioner. I think there's an increased likelihood that FGOI students don't have people they talk with routinely about the steps they took in professional life. It may be stressful to confront the future since college is a way of putting that phase of life off. It may feel oddly disrespectful to your guardians to aspire to earn more or do more in a career. It may be that there's just nobody telling them a degree alone won't guarantee them a satisfying career. Uh, and then an access practitioner noted, I also think there's a push to get to college, but then no one knows what to do after that. They may have not have an access to mentors and support systems in the same way as students who have a family history of college going. And then the last one was also from access practitioner. Many schools have support systems for freshmen, but they seem to disappear as they become upperclassmen. So a lot of these were really talked about uh, this, uh, not having the structural systemic systems or supports in place to support students with this kind of transitional aspect, uh, whether it be instrumental or informational. Uh, so moving on from my results, talking just about some recommendations for practice, uh, implementation of the field, as well as future research. So uh, one suggestion I have is, uh, I think a lot of people have been saying this for a few years now, is more collaboration and professional development between access and success communities and institutions. One example I've always had, I've always purported to have, is an accessible online curriculum that kind of details challenges that students have throughout their educational journey from access to success to, to career or graduate school. Um, and that way that anyone at any point in time can understand uh, these challenges as they're advising them into the next step so that there is a more seamless transition. Uh, another idea I've had is uh, a transition agreements between programs that are either TRIO access to TRIO success programs. So uh, Talent Search Upward Bound to the success being Student Support Service and McNair, or even between uh, TRIO access to, to non success programs like bottom line or non-trio programs to access to non-trio success. I found that a lot of organizations are set up to have the support at one level or other, but then they pass it on or assume that the student will get support afterwards, which isn't always the case. At the success level, um, the majority of the support actually comes from the institution itself, from their own programs they've set up. There isn't as many uh, nonprofit providers in that area as there is in the access level. Uh, and then finally, in terms of research, I think there needs to be more research on the practitioners' identities and their experiences when they were in school or in their workplace, uh, including their uh, 
race, their if they were first general income in school, how that affected their experiences. Uh, and because I do think that that influences their interactions with students and what they think, what works for them might work for everyone else. And we know that's not always the case. So looking more at the practitioner's identities and experiences. And then the last one is looking more so at the perceptions and, and identities of leaders in this space, whether at the district level, the state level, or at the federal level, who often are instrumental in making policies and procedures that affect the outcomes of youth, but they don't work with youth uh, in these settings one on one is direct service providers. So looking more at their experiences and how that translates to how they're inter they interact with these uh, programs and these youth. A little bit of just limitations. This was, it did rely on a convenient sampling. So uh, what we had available to us at the time through the listservs and social media provided us or who uh, decided to opt into it. That can limit the findings in that we don't have robust representation of all different types of practitioners that could be represented here. Like we said, I said earlier, there are much more success practitioners and access practitioners. So might be missing out on that uh, experience as well as looking at more passive practitioners versus active practitioners. Um, again, and I said the, another challenge was with repetition of issues. So for instance, imposter syndrome and mental health were, were mentioned repeatedly in different categories, both for academic and social. And so that could pose a challenge if we're talking, if they're not elaborating on what that means, we have different definitions for different challenges. And so to interpret those uh, categories specifically with, with caution and future research. So now we've turned to the discussion questions, Terry. Yeah, cool. Thank you, Josh, wonderful work. Uh, so thank you for sharing with us. We'll now invite our very special guest, Dr. Amanda Parada, Villataro. Did I get your did I get it right? Or I got it wrong. Close. Via Toro. Via Toro. I'm gonna yeah. work on it. Toro uh, like she, there we go. She is the director of college success at Alliance College Ready Public Schools in Los Angeles, California. I did get that right, correct? College counseling. Yes. <laughs> College counseling. There we go. Uh, so prior to working at Alliance, she was the director of college access in the Center for Access and Entertainment at DePaul University. It is with this experience that we're happy to hear her thoughts about Josh's research. So Amanda, my first question for you is, what is your initial reaction to Josh's work? What were some of the key takeaways that sort of stood out for you? And do you have any lingering questions? Yeah, no, definitely um, having been on the enrollment management side of things in higher ed, um, and then in the college access and success piece, and then now on the K-12 side of things, um, I do feel like my initial reactions um, to it were like, one, not surprised, two, that uh, not surprised that there are different experiences on the access side versus the um, success side of things, right? Um, and I think it's, uh, my, my thought initially was that this might be stemming from um, where scholars or where students are in that, in that college choice process, right? In the college enrollment process. So, um, I do feel um, that some of the bigger barriers that were experienced um, by or that that were perceived by per, uh, practitioners on the access side um, often have to do with like the imposter syndrome of like I don't know if these are schools I'm good enough to get into I don't know like self-selecting out and then how that might be experienced for students on the access I'm sorry the success side might be, I'm here now, it's not what I'm thinking it is, there's no one like me, so that that it might be a different experience. So I guess I'm kind of like answering both questions at the same time here, but mm -hmm. um, definitely feeling like the students in the study, um, I, I feel like for Shen low income students, um, you know, there tends to be like a deficit narrative that we, we approach this with, right? And, um, something that was, I think, pulled out in the study was that, you know, these systems, um, higher ed was never created for first gen low income students. Um, so there's lots of barriers just embedded within higher ed. And we've asked students to do a lot of bending to the system. And we haven't asked the systems in the same respect to bend back, right? And you can only bend so far until you snap, right? And so I think um, absolutely that the first gen low income status of these students is influencing the 
the the disparities, right? I it, it hadn't how they're impacted by it because not only are they just transitioning from high school to college, college to career, but doing that with within a system that expects them to come with certain knowledge bases, certain relationships um, that they're trying to figure out that they need and build at the same time. So I'm absolutely not surprised um, and understand that, you know, for this particular population, that these disparities are particularly influential on them. Yeah. So Josh, two things that came out, type of student and the ways these problems are manifested. What is, what is your take on it? Yeah, I mean, you think about it as a, it's like a funneling process, right? So it starts out, you have a large amount of students that apply, uh, then a, a lot fewer students that get accepted, then a lot fewer students that have this kind of yield rate or that actually end up en enrolling. Mm -hmm. And so what you get is uh, different types of needs for certain students, right? And so I think about, for instance, a lot of people don't know when we talk about the history of higher ed, that we talk about this aspect of character. So when we get recommendations from our teachers or our principals, that actually came about in the early 1900s as a way to exclude Jewish students. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that a lot of those policies that were from the top three schools that influenced undergraduate culture, which were Princeton, Yale, and <clears throat> Harvard, still influence our decisions today in higher ed. And so when you have students that uh, look good on paper or on your kind of standing when they get there, that's a different type of student than the student who also might have come from the same community but they didn't get in and they didn't go or because whether because they were not accepted or because they never applied because they had other challenges. Um, I think when we talk, for instance, the different types of students that might go enroll in a four year versus a two year, uh, a lot of people look at it as a, a great difference in understanding uh, these students. Well, it's not really that per se, it's that they might have different challenges. You know, so like they can both come from poverty, but how well have they adjusted or, or been resilient in the face of that, right? So. Uh, one that can, when we talk about wellness, if you see that they're getting a 4.0 while they grew up uh, in poverty or that they're, they were in the first in a family to go to college, we assume that they're doing well and that that they are going to be more likely to acclimate or assimilate into these environments. Whereas you have another student who came from the same kind of background, but uh, and the same kind of challenges, but they didn't do as well academically. So then we place them as a different type of student. Um, and then that kind of informs how we treat them. So you see these students when they get to college on paper, because uh, I feel like college is a, sometimes a way to start over because no one knows your story. So you're constantly having to out yourself to support. And if you don't, if you don't seem like you're an open person, they might not feel comfortable enough sharing with you their struggles about who they are. And so when you have this kind of constant identity, you're seeing different aspects of students. I see at the aspect the access level, when I look at this, that I think access, we're more likely to have relationships with these students because um, they, they knew them for a lot more time and they in their home communities. Whereas when you get to college, it's often after something happened, right? After they are on, at risk of academic failure or after, um, you know, they're in student counseling because they're going through some major issue within their life. And so they, they, if you're seeing those different aspects of them, that's informing what you think of this population overall um, and how that influences your perceptions of them. Beautiful. Amanda, do you have any, any additional thoughts? Uh, about yeah. The report? Yeah. No, absolutely. I'm just thinking about the manifestations um, between high school and college, especially imposter syndrome. And something that's sticking out to me is the importance of uh, a sense of belonging, right? Right, and especially at the college level. Um, and especially for students that we consider like the exceptional ones, right? Those who are like, you know, the top performers, the top service uh, records, you know, the top athletes where you're used to kind of being like exceptional. And then you're in an environment now where you're normal, right? And what that does to you, right? Do I belong here? Um, and even for our students that we are not considered um, you know, even for like those students that are not necessarily like the, the straight A valedictorians this or that, just going from an environment um, where, you know, maybe you're more normalized, right? They're at school environments where the, their uh, ethnic background is reflected uh, amongst their peers, amongst faculty and others, and others. And then you go to like a PWI or an institution where you don't feel reflected, how that sense of belonging or lack of infiltrates all these other areas like academics, right? Your academic performance, 
um, comfort level to reach out for help. If you don't feel like you belong, who would you, why would you ask for help, right? If you, like to Josh, to use Josh's words, how, why would you out yourself, right? Um, and like validate that you don't belong, right? You're assuming that everyone else does, but not you. Every, no one else needs help, just me, right? So I'm just thinking about how just the, what if you feel you belong or you don't feel belong, how you belong, how that can impact other areas um, of your college experience, right? Um, and how that can impact the mental health, how that can impact, you know, career or major exploration, right? Um, so tied to that sense of imposter syndrome, but also thinking a little bit about the sense of being cared for or trust that you'll be cared for. Um, a lot of our students have the privilege of coming from schools where they had like a nice counselor, or a teacher, or some adult, right? That was like cheering them on, right? Um, and was able to get them through, help support them through the college doors, right? Um, but then going to a new institution where you don't have those relationships necessarily established, um, it's hard to feel like if I'm having a problem, there's somebody here that will care for me or that I'm even cared about, right? Um, and if I don't belong and I don't feel like I'm cared about or can find care here, again, what does that do to one's mental health, one's, one's academic performance and one's long-term success in college? So just some thoughts that are kind of like, I don't have answers to any of these. I'm just kind of thinking about how this all kind of intertwines together um, and manifests at the success side. Thing. Yeah, and I th I think we have these experience our experiences of what well, education that are that are fragmented, right? So with, within the access side, it can feel like there's a pressure on schools or on nonprofits to to have this formulaic approach to make sure that they get into a school, um, whether that be no matter where it's a two year or four year. Uh, you look at uh, school districts' mission statements, a lot of them will say college, career, and or citizen ready, and it, it's been like that for a very long time, and while they say that, um, and we've had this kind of comprehensive high school since, what, 1918 or so, this, this still has been a big push on post-secondary education since probably the late 70s or early 80s. Um, and so when we think about the, these kind of pressures that access practitioners have versus those access practitioners, that this is now something that we're looking back or growing in terms of um, a public awareness because at the college level, once you get there, like like a one practitioner said, they don't know what to do after that. They worked so hard to get into school and then having to learn relearn an entirely new environment. Um, but you have fragmenting of responsibilities too, right? And so while we do have this at in some sense at the K through 12 level, like your teachers when your math teacher does your this and then your school counselor does the social emotional learning and the testing. Uh, we know that the K through 12 level, they take on a lot more uh, multiple roles. Whereas when you try to get into the, the higher ed level or the post-secondary level and you have a, a student has a need, it's like, oh, there's an office for that. Or there's a part for that. I remember when I was in school, uh, I was having challenges at certain times and I would feel comfortable enough with a faculty or staff member because I just wanted to know them. I just wanted someone to know me that I would share my some of the challenges I had going on with home. And they would either say one of two things, either one, let me take you to Odos, the Dean of Students, because that was their job, or let me take you to counseling, because they either assumed that I needed something that that was Dean of Students responsibility to listen to my social emotional side, or counseling um, to focus on my kind of introvert, that wasn't what I was looking for. So you have this kind of um, shifting of the experience and that, that can feel hard for a student when they're not sure who to go to or what office is most meant to support them when they just want someone that will listen at some times. And so I think that affects the quality of their experience if they don't feel like they have someone to go to, whether it's academically, whether it's socially, personally, or professionally, or even financially, like that's financial aid office for that, and academics office for this. And so uh, that's the challenge I have with it. So yeah, and then, oh, go ahead. No, I, I was like, that was a long wind answer to a short question. No, when you're talking, though, it just made me think about, um, you know, the pressures on the K-12 side, right? Um, particularly on counseling teams and college counseling teams um, to prep students, right? I, I, I see this on the higher ed side and I experience on the K-12 side that, you know, why aren't these kids coming to us ready for this? Why aren't they, why don't they know about, 
you know, the financial aid office? Why don't they know? And I feel like there's a disconnect between the incredible lift. It just gets students to submit a college application. And I'm here in California and it's crazy how the admission process works out here in terms of very strict deadlines, very specific academic requirements, lots of stuff that goes into it. And it's very, very important that each step is completed correctly because a single mishap can derail a student even before their application is read, right? Um, and so just the mechanical side of applying to college is such an incredibly heavy list or lift. And that's just for seniors. Don't forget there's ninth, 10th and 11th graders that counselors are still serving, right? And so a lot of that development in terms of like having those conversations about support services or career exploration often has to get fit in between all the lift with carrying seniors, right? And that's just kind of how it plays out. A lot of our first gen low income serving schools um, is that the early prep, that, that non-cognitive development, the, the combating post imposter syndrome, thinking about budgeting, life skills, how to ask for help, that stuff that often just doesn't, it, it has to be deprioritized, doesn't happen at all, or it's just getting in here or there. Um, not that folks don't want to do that. We know that this is needed, but the sheer reality on the ground is that um, seniors take a lot of lift and then that's just one part of a counselor's job. They still have the socio-emotional side. They still have the academic side and administrative things. They may need to be supervising a lunch period, things like that, that get them pulled in a lot of different directions. So the expectations I feel sometimes higher ed has on K-12 to get students to them ready to navigate this is unrealistic um, on the ground. Yes, everybody wants this. We know earlier development is the best, but our structures currently are not set up in a way to allow this to happen equitably across um, the board and specifically, certainly not for first-gen low-income serving schools, for sure. Um, so I'm just trying to think of like that disconnect and the partnership that needs to kind of happen um, between the higher ed and the K-12 side. Um, to kind of de-silo it, but also understand that we're all working within our own different uh, parameters and that there are real restrictions to what can actually be done and expecting just one side to take care of this and the other, we're seeing that that's not really best serving most, most folks. So what are some ideas for us to work more collaboratively together on the holistic readiness and success of our, of our students? Mm, I think I've mentioned that there needs to be more vertical integration or collaboration between the two, but I think also horizontal collaboration. I think especially between higher ed, there's a, always a silo within the institutions and between institutions that they they don't want to always collaborate with each other or they look at it from a competitive, competitive lens like, oh, this institution has this program, so we need to have it, right? We need to, and so I think there's a space for that because if you look at the four categories I studied that they're not they're not independent of each other. They all interact. And so to, to be, to serve the whole student and make sure that they are, have their needs met, you have to address all four and understand how they rely on each other um, and have these uh, intersectional programming in place. I think about when I was advising at a student, I always asked them, I had this, uh, I had this intake advising method I had developed myself and I broke down these four categories to understand all their challenges at once in, in a memo so that all faculty have to understand that so they have to keep repeating themselves. Um, and so when we got to the career section, I would always ask like, oh, what do you want to do? What do your parents want you to do? Why do you want to do that? And and I asked one student and she said she wanted to go into nursing and I went a step beyond and I said, well, why nursing? And she said, well, you know, my mom passed a, a little bit ago. She died from cancer. And I remember that the nurses took really good care of her and I wanted to make someone feel like that. And I'm like, that made me mad because we don't ask those types of questions. We need to know these things if we're going to support these students. Um, and so we got to really think about how do we develop more relationship-based uh, supports uh, between and beyond K through 12 to higher ed and between the K through 12 to K through 12, higher ed to higher ed. Okay, so should we move on, Terry? Yeah, well, I got to ask one more question for Amanda. So Amanda, oh, yeah. with all this research, we love to see how we can get it close to changing policy or practice. Do you have any advice for Josh about how he can leverage this to get it in the field? 
Yeah, I would say working from a home office, like network position on the K-12 side, I think having these conversations with like school district leaders, having these conversations with provosts and um, school president or university presidents is really important. Um, finding spaces where we can bring these folks together and sharing information like this, I think is a critical first step because we need buy-in from the very top. Um, in order to provide the system structures and money, let's be honest, uh, <laughs> to make this all happen. Um, we know folks on the ground, I mean, your research shows we want to do this work. We know it's needed, mm -hmm. but it's the, the systems and structures and the leadership buy-in that I think is often an impediment. I mean, college access and success, you know, or college success and attainment, um, you know, it, in my experience where I was working previously was its own separate office away from admissions, away from enrollment management or, or from financial aid. Even though we worked with all of these offices um, as partners, um, it wasn't really embedded, I would say from the top down. It wasn't mm -hmm. something that um, aside, like we were those folks, we were the access and attainment folks, right? But I would, I would argue that it was not seen as every employee's in the, off, in, in the university's job to ensure the success of a student, right? Like, kind of, like you said, kind of shuffling off to like, that. oh, that's that department, right? Oh, access and attainment, you're first gen, go, go talk to Amanda. And I'm like, okay, great, but like, I'm not the whole university, right? So what are we going to do um, systemically to ensure that we have an environment and the resources and support and the right folks to, to really honor this work and to do it right and right to really build these out but we need strong leadership or else it's not going to happen and we need that agreement and that connection between the k-12 and the higher ed to really work together and see how the different pieces of the puzzle can come together and what those structures and support should be like and then really buy into it um, so that would be my my recommendation like find these spaces where we can get those those k-12 and those university leaders or create those spaces where they can come together and really have these meaningful conversations and generate, um, you know, like a groundswell of support, like, no, we need to act on this and then getting that buy-in and building from there. Amanda, we appreciate you. Always lovely seeing you. <laughs> cool. Great. We, we will now open the discussion up to the audience. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box. We have about 12 minutes, 10 minutes. And let me see if we have some already. Um, I got one for you, Josh. You still there? All right. Yeah. Uh, he says, I was a first-gen low-income uh, college student, and now I'm a SSS director. I responded to the survey and believe we are uh, both access and success focused. So please clarify how you differentiated the two, access and success. Yeah. And so... I think that was something I mentioned, well, that sure you touched on more of in terms of future research is thinking about in hindsight, I asked what their, how they identified right then and there access or success, but not thinking about their prior roles, if they have switched between these communities and how that might have influenced their experiences. So I do think that uh, future research, a little bit more robust than mine, more resources than mine, um, should explore that kind of uh, experience. Those that have, tr the practitioners that have transitioned from both, so kind of like Amanda, that have had experience in both communities, um, and look at them versus those that just had one or the other. I think that'd be a, a good future study to look at. Beautiful. I have a second question. Let's see. Uh, you mentioned that finances are the number one reason why students drop out of college. Can you share other factors? Yeah, so uh, in terms of the academic category, we have lack of adjustment to the kind of rigor of college. So I don't like that word if it makes feel like that college is more than K through 12. But the, the reality is, is that the standards of K through 12 might be different than the standards of, of college. And that could be a, an adjustment for students that are hard to transition into. So like, like you get a lot more free time in college and how do you manage that free time or especially after work, et cetera. Uh, the another one uh, is sense of belonging. So whether it has to do because of your, your, so, your economic status, your race, parents' educational attainment. So these various micro, macro, macro 
aggressions you experience from from faculty and staff or from peers while you're in college that make you feel like oh you know maybe this isn't for me maybe I'm just not capable of this that can kind of lead into posture syndrome I think uh, another issue challenge is with the uh, family support so uh, most students for instance uh, work uh, whether you're first gen or not it's like an average like 12 hours but for first gen low income students it's it's often 20 hours or more and, and we find that once it gets past 20 hours that can be hard to balance both work and studies and if they don't have adequate financial aid it, you know just one small mishap can lead to them like okay i just, I'm just drop out i just I can't handle this or i can't enroll this semester i see it time and time again is that students I was actually speaking at a conference last week and I ran into someone I haven't seen in six years. And um, he was going to school and he was working at a, um, a store and he said that he just ran out of money and he didn't want to go into debt. Uh, he didn't understand the financial aid. And so he, he, he quit. Um, so in order to explain that to him. So uh, I think those are some of the other factors that attribute to dropping out or retention, issues with retention. These are good questions. These are good answers. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to keep pushing. Um, we have talked about the socio-emotional impact in mental health, as well as the cultural capital of first-generation students. However, at the most basic level, what should we be aware of in serving first-generation students? Uh, yeah, so I think, uh, I think just in general, especially those that don't work with students, is that we make a lot of assumptions about who students are. And like Amanda said, that post-secondary education was not made for students, I guess, in mind, especially um, if you attend public school, if you you know, identify as low income or you're the first in your family, or if you're a student of color, we, we know that we have not the nicest roots uh, in this country in terms of those. And so even though that some of that has changed, there are a lot of assumptions that we still keep in place, whether it be from our perspectives or in the policies that we write um, with students. So. Um, just thinking about we need to be asking more than we assume and so what i something else i did when i was working with students is uh, i would do a basic needs assessment mm -hmm. um so i would implement with the students so i knew okay how many of them have food day in day out and and in that survey it wasn't just in understanding about their instrumental supports uh material supports but also i asked them here's i gave them a definition for an adult advocate someone you go to that you trust that you, that you feel connected to that supports you whether it be a family or non-family um, after reading that, do you feel like you have one? Um, and then if so, who is that and what is their contact info? So that way I always had some access to um, understanding beyond the academic side of students. I think we just in general might resume their wellness to, to reduce it to their grades. Like if they're getting straight A's or fine, which isn't always the case. And so um, ask more than we assume. And I think being proactive in collecting this information and relationship building before they need something. Perfect. I have one more for you. It's a little bit long, but it's not bad. It's a great one, actually. And this is more of, listen, just tell me your reaction, all right? So, okay, pre-college versus college seems to be your distinction, but access is more than getting students admitted. Access is also connecting with services, knowing where to go for whatever issues are challenging them, getting support needed to help them overcome challenges, et cetera. Access is more of the process of getting than getting through. Success are the many smaller positive outcomes that move students along that build self-esteem, generate and achieve goals, managing the imposter syndrome. I say manage, not necessarily overcome because I still had to manage it during my doctoral studies. Do you have any initial reaction to that um, thoughts? Yeah, so I, I think the challenge is that we don't have operationalized definitions. So what I say is access for success can be someone else's definition. Um, so we don't have that standard, you know, how I defined it as uh, those that's supporting getting into college. About, however, we do know that a lot of students rely on these practitioners that they interact with at the high school level, even while they're in college, because they feel like they might not have had them at the success level while they're in college. Um, I do think just systemically, there aren't, traditionally, there aren't many programs that do both. Um, I think there is a growing trend of this, but mm -hmm. oftentimes it's either been access programs only and then, or success programs only that help them at the college level. And so um, that could be a, a challenge if a student didn't have access to either one, but there are some that are growing. Like um, I keep, I don't know why I keep coming to this one, but bottom line uh, is one I know that does both access and success. And I, I know there's a plethora of others. I have it in my research um, 
on uh, one of my on my website too. But yeah, I think um, I think the best definition and the best support is when we have both, um, uh, both the the deep supports, both the, getting them in, helping them navigate as they're going through, as well as like these kind of outcomes that um, traditionally we like to denote as our success for students. Perfect. Um, great. I think that's the last Q and A. Let me check. Yep. I will note that Josh. Uh, I think you got some friends in the chat box sending you emails. They want, people want you to contact them. Share oh, them. here's my here's my stuff. Here's my um email and and yeah, stuff. Yeah. If any questions about uh, Josh's research, feel free to reach out to him. And of course, you can always uh, visit visit us at the Pell Institute. So I will. Josh, any final thoughts before I conclude it? No, I, I'm glad for everyone being here, but I, I do encourage you to go on my website because it has a lot of my other previous research and materials and resources I've developed that address some of your questions. Um, and so uh, I think that will be helpful. And then please reach out to me. Like I said, I, I love connecting with people and helping them with the doing this work. So thank you all for joining us for today's webinar. We hope you enjoy Josh's research. Uh, Josh's report will be posted on our Pell website. It's www.pellinstitute.org by the end of the month. And everyone attending today's webinar will receive a copy of the report via email. So we'll try to make sure you get um, a nice PDF of it. Um, in the meantime, we hope you have a great rest of your day. And if you have any questions, as mentioned before, please feel free to contact Josh or the Pell Institute. Thank you very much.